couple questions that people usually have on uh, faith. Um, I, I had like four or five Bible studies laid out, and I always try to get a feel for what which one should be fits the season. But um, you know, I'll, I'll just say this before I start on this about prayer. Uh, for me, it, it works for me to have a journal of of what I pray, how much I pray every day, because it keeps me consistent. Without that, I, I'm hot and cold, and I, it's real hard for me to, I, I can derail so easy in prayer. So that, to be consistent, there has to be something that is routine. But prayer is so powerful, but yet it's, it's really, by and large, it's not a priority. And I was thinking about that, why is that? Uh, that is not a priority. It, it changes the atmosphere. It changes homes, relationships. It changes a nation. Um, and I was just thinking about that. Why is it not a priority? And you know, when we turn on the lights, uh, we could see how electricity works. But if you don't understand how it works, we don't just sit in the dark. We know it works. And so, just like prayer, we know it works. Luke 18 and 1 says, Luke 18 and 1 says, men always should always pray and not give up. I think that word give up is, that's, that's a human nature to give up on that. And there's a lot of reasons why. But um, some of the, sometimes people give up on prayer because they don't know that it works and, and, or they can't see it working. This is important in the invisible world. It, there's an invisible world world and we can't see it, how it works. Uh, we can't, we can't see gravity, but you know how powerful gravity is. Just jump off the bridge and you'll find out real fast. And so even in the Bible, there's a lot of situations that Elisha one time was sitting there with and, and his servant went outside and, and they, the house was surrounded by, by the enemy and the servant was panicking and Elisha could see in the visible world. And he says, just relax. There's more for us than there is against us. There's an invisible world. And he prayed for him so he could see in the supernatural world. And he saw that there was more people, there's more angels surrounded that place than the enemies he could see, there's a there's a natural realm and there's a physical realm there's a invisible realm so you could see that all through the bible um i was just thinking about this we had uh some neighbors that could not stand our family because we were i remember as a kid i said how come they don't like us um you know that i told you they throw trash over our yard and all kinds of stuff and we just pick it up and and my mom says, we're Christians. They just don't like us. And um, they, had a, they had a cotton tree that was right next to our, our um, fence. And man, when that thing produced cotton, it, our whole backyard looked like a snow, just white. And, and it would jam our pipes up. We'd rake it up and clean it up. So one day, my dad went over there and asked him. They said, my dad said, uh, we'll pay for it if you cut that tree down. Oh, they loved it. They said that tree's not coming down. <laughs> so I, I was in, and these people, they could not stand us. And this is what scared me is we were in the kitchen and we pointed to that tree, my dad, my mom, all of us. And we said, we curse you in the name of Jesus. And I'm not, I, I'm telling you before God, within two weeks or something like that, I went outside and that tree was leaning against their house. It, it bent their roof. It just, and I, the, the thoughts that came to me, I was scared because they were waiting to blame us. I knew, I, I thought, they probably thought we, we put poison in that tree. That tree was healthy producing all that. And I'm just saying this, the invisible realm is so strong if people would put God first and prayer first. We don't know what's going on on the other side. Um, in the 1960s, I remember as a kid, eight, nine years old, my mom would always interpret tongues. And I remember she would point, her head was pointed up 
and she'd look up and she, her head would go back and forth like this. And as an eight-year-old or nine-year-old, I said, mom, how do, how do you know what to say to interpret tongues? You know how an eight-year-old is. And she says, I'm just reading it. It's in the air. The words, I'm just reading. I saw her head go back and forth all the time. She would just read it. When it disappeared, she would stop. I just brought that up to show you that the invisible world is so powerful. And if people could shake that realm up, it's more powerful than what we could see. And so uh, I don't have to understand everything. I don't have to see it. Uh, yet we're not, we're not, uh, we're, this is not blind faith. We're having faith in the word of God, our GPS. That's what we're having faith in. But if I go outside and I see the sun, it takes no faith. There's the sun. There's the moon. There's no faith in that. Um, there has to be an element of faith in our walk. It's just not going to just be there. It has to be we walk by faith, not by sight, not by feelings. And so non-believers, they do things without knowing that it works. They always say we're blind faith, but They'll get on an airplane and not know how that thing works. Or they'll eat an apple and not know how it, it grows on a stem from a tree. They're walking by. They'll do things without figuring everything out. They don't have to know everything. So uh, one of the reasons people don't pray is because of doubt. And, and there's questions that people have. I'm going to give you three of them. Here's a short one, and then the other ones are a little bit longer. Uh, here's the one that I wrote down. Does God hear the prayers of sinners? And the answer is yes. None of us would be saved if he, if he didn't. In fact, we probably kind of sin every day under God's microscope. But he does hear sinners' prayer. And... Um, Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, Cornelius was a pagan. He was a sinner in Acts 10, and God heard his prayers. Nineveh was a pagan country, a sinful country, and God heard their prayers. And here's the, here's the scripture that people get tripped up on. John 9 and 31, John 9 and 31, God heareth not sinners. That's what it says. John 9, 31, but that was a blind man that was saying that. That wasn't, that, that was just his opinion, but that's not what the Bible says. Fact, 1 John 1 and 9 says, 1 John 1 and 9 says that if we, the church, sins, that we could confess our sins. So yes, he hears sinners. So that's number one. Number two is, why pray when God already knows what we need? Way in advance. God already knows everything. He knows our thoughts. He knows all of that kind of stuff. But Matthew 6 and 8 is a puzzling scripture. Matthew 6 and 8, it says, For your father knoweth what things ye have need of before you ask. He already knows before you even ask. And people will say, well, why, why even ask? He already knows. Or why do you have a prayer life? But praying is for fellowship with God. It's to know him. It's to connect with him. Second uh, Corinthians 6 and 1. Second Corinthians 6 and 1. It says, as workers together, we are inviting God into our lives. As workers together. Second Corinthians 6 and 1. Um, when I used to fly around with my friend Jerry in his little Cessna plane as a teenager, I wouldn't do it today in that little jop, jalopy. But we would fly. He would say, you want to you wanna take the steering wheel here. Uh, but we were workers together. He was the expert. I was, I didn't know what I was doing. But it's like God is in control, but he wants to participate with us. That's why that's one of the reasons we pray. Matthew 7, verse 22 and 23. Matthew 7, verse 22 and verse 23. Here's some people they were saying, God, we prophesied in your name. We, we cast out devils. We did mighty works in your name. 
And he says something shocking. He says, but I never knew you. And of course he knew them, but the word there means I never had a relationship. I never had fellowship with you. Isn't that something somebody could work in the gifts of spirit and not even be a connected to God? So Matthew 7, verse 7 and 8, Matthew 7, verse 7 and 8, it says these three things, ask, seek, and knock. Ask, seek, and knock. Each one of those gets you a little bit closer to God. At first, you're asking, and then you're seeking him out. You're getting closer from asking to seeking him. Then you're going to the door. Now you're knocking. Each step gets you closer. And I noticed this. Prayer, it, it evolves this way. It gets deeper and deeper. It goes from asking to seeking. And I noticed that at the altar calls, I, I remember the old timers, they would stay at the altar. And I, I'm, I'm as guilty as anybody. The last so many years, it's just kind of a quick fix at the altar, you know, raise my hands, hi, God. But those guys would just stay there and it gets deeper and the breakthroughs come from staying there. It says, asketh, E-T-H, seeketh, knocketh, E-T-H, on all of those means a continuation. It's not a one-shot deal. You're constant. It's fellowship. And so, yes, he knows before we ask, but he wants fellowship. Here's the deal is the Bible lets us know about him, right? The facts, the truth, the details. and so. But prayer gets us to where we know him. One, we know about him. The other one, we get to know who he is. And so it's like famous people. You could read about them, but you don't really know them. If they start inviting you to their birthday party, that means you know them, right? So um, Luke 18 and 1 says, Luke 18 and 1 says, men ought to pray. So why pray if God already knows all this? It also, it develops us. You know, uh, my dad pulled up to a little, well, you know, those back way back in the 40s, pulled up to a little restaurant where they come out in the roller skates. And this girl comes out in a roller skate. And it happened to be my mom. And my dad asked her out on a date. She was putting the food up there on this window, and uh, she said, I'm too busy. He came back, asked her again. She says, no. And so he came back, and uh, he's, first he said, I, I need to work on myself. Maybe I need to uh, dress a little nicer. And uh, so he started to examine himself, and he hooked her. So I think, you know, 2 Corinthians 11 Second uh, Corinthians 13, it says, examine yourself. And so God already knows our prayers, but it causes us to start digging deeper into who we are. We start examining ourselves. We get closer to him. We start, here's another one. We start to depend on him. That's what prayer is, is you're depending on him. People that don't pray are saying, I don't need God. That's what they're really saying. Every day in my prayers, I'm going, God, without you, and then there's the list. I can't do anything. So when I'm flying with my, when I used to fly with my friend Jerry, I would say, let me fly. But I was really depending on him because we would crash that plane. I guarantee you that. So sometimes God takes, sometimes God takes away little props because we're depending on other things, friends, money. And then he says, I got to get you to depend on me. That's what prayer is. I just don't want a Jonah situation in my life where God says, I'm going to have to shake you up. So Moses depended on God. This is what it says. But this is what Moses said. I won't go unless you go with me, Lord. Remember that? I, I'm not going to do anything unless you're involved in this thing. I'm depending on God. We pray to know him. We pray to, so it could develop us. We pray uh, so we could show God that we're depending on him. 
And although he already knows, but he wants all these things. These are questions that people ask. Number one, does God hear sinners? Yes. Why, why pray when God already knows? I know a guy that could have been mightily used. He always says, God already knows. I'm not going to even pray. And he's as carnal as a $9 bill. Let's go to number three. Number three, does God always give us what we ask for? That's the big one. Does God always give us what we ask for? Number three. And there's a lot of frustration prayer uh, and people lose faith. And, and, and so sometimes God answer, answers us instantly. It's an instant yes. That's the answer. Uh, Jesus told the disciples to put their nets on the other side of the boat. Instantly, there's an answer. Paul was bit by a po poisonous snake. Instantly healing. Uh, judgment on Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5. Instant. That was instant. And so sometimes our prayers are instantly yes, and sometimes it's delayed. And that's where the frustration comes right there. You ever have kids ask you for something, and the delay is they don't have any faith in the delay. They only have faith in the yes. And so uh, Revelations chapter 6, there's these tribulation saints that were killed. They were martyred. And they asked God up in heaven. They were just martyred in the, in the tribulation. They said, when are you going to take revenge for what they did? And he says, hold on. It's going to take me about six more years, not until you get to about Revelations 19. And then I'm going to gather them all up and I'm going to punish all of them. They had to wait for years. Joseph's dream took 13 years. That's a big delay right there. Uh, the promise of Pentecost was 10 days. Those guys must have had a nervous breakdown. Uh, the promise of Abraham having a son, 25 years. I would have backslid by then. Just kidding. So you got, you got three years, 13 years here, 10 days, 25-year delays. And here's the thing is we have to trust in the delay, in the wait. I trust in God's delaying things because it saved me before. That's for sure. So um, we have to have more faith in the delay. And sometimes the answer is no. You know, uh, Apostle Paul asked God to remove move a thorn in his flesh three times. And God says, nope, not going to do it. The disciples asked Jesus to cast fire down on a village and he said, no. Acts 16. Man, Paul got turned down a bunch of times. Acts 16, he got, God said no to him twice. He said, you know, I'm planning to go west to preach. And the Holy Ghost said, no, you're not going. And then Paul said, well, I'll go north. And the Holy Ghost said, no, you're not going. So no is an answer. I got to have faith in the no I got to have faith in the yes, and I got to have faith in the delay. Does that make sense? So, uh, Paul, Apostle Paul, I was looking at scriptures. He really did have faith in all three of those. Uh, there was a, a man that was instantly healed. He, from, he could start walking in Acts 14, verse 8 through 10. Acts 14, verse 8 through 10. Instant healing. And then Paul, uh, he started praying about something in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And God said, no, it's not going to happen. And I like what Paul said. I take pleasure in the no. He got to, his faith was so strong where when God said no, he just relaxed with it. And so the three Hebrew boys, I like their faith. They were getting going to be thrown in the fire. And they just said this. They said, if God delivers us, he's God. If God doesn't deliver us, he's God. I like that kind of faith right there. So I have trust in the no, the yes, and the delay. And so a lot of Christians, they have frustrated prayer, and they give up. That's why that scripture says, 
men ought to always pray. And Paul must have known. And don't give up because there's a temptation right there. And so listen to this. I was thinking about this. If God answered every prayer, we would have an endless list of requests. Uh, and we would end up playing God. God, I need a Mercedes spin. Bam. I need all my enemies to be destroyed. Bam. I need $10 million, bam. So, I mean, uh, I could pay the church off. <laughs> but so we would just have this, we would end up playing God if he just said yes, yes, yes. But he knows best if we can handle all those things. So when it's no, I look at it like this. I really do. I think he's protecting me. If it's delayed, he's protecting me. And you know, I've learned this right here. Sometimes people are so persistent in wanting God to do it their way. There's times in the Bible God says, okay, I'm going to teach you a good lesson. I'm going to let you have your way. In, in fact, in 1 Samuel 8, those people were persistent. They wanted a king. And Samuel said, God says, Samuel warned them what a king will do to you. He's going to make you into slaves. He's going, to di he's going to be a dictator. And the people says, we want a king anyway. They got there and God says, okay, I'll give you what you keep pushing for. So I would rather have faith the first time he says no and then see where everything lands from there. And sometimes, check this out. Sometimes something good could not be good for us. Does that make sense? Something good could not be good for us. My brother Mark, if he drinks milk, milk is good, but he'll he'll cough on the phone for an hour. I'll call he'll call me up somewhere and I'll go, you drank milk, huh? <laughs> yeah. And he said the other day, he or a couple months ago, he said, I, I knew I shouldn't, but the pastor brought apple pie out. It was hot, and they brought brought vanilla ice cream. And I couldn't resist. So that's all good, but it wasn't good for him. Genesis 3, right there, the tree of knowledge. You would think, well, that's good. You get some knowledge here, but it wasn't good for Adam and Eve. Uh, Saul gave David his armor for protection. You would think, well, it's for protection. That's good. But it wasn't good for him. So sometimes... A blessing could cause people to forget, right? You know, I noticed something. Vietnam is being blessed so highly right now. Vietnam. It was a poor country. They're being blessed to the point where they're so busy, they're forgetting God. Something good is causing them to backslide. On the other hand, South Korea is on their knees let me tell you why they're going to church and they're, they got a powerful church because North Korea is a thorn in their flesh. They don't know if missiles are going to be flying tomorrow, but you let North Korea surrender all those, all that and become a country like South Korea. I guarantee you South Korea will stop going to church. Sometimes that thorn is the only thing that keeps us together. So watch this scripture right here. James 4 and 3, James 4 and 3, ye ask and ye receive not, because ye ask amiss. That means you have the wrong purpose in asking. You know what I mean? I'm asking for riches or power with God. Maybe my motives are not good right here. That ye may consume it upon your own desires. So, Sometimes I have to search my heart. Why am I asking for this? Why is God saying no? It could be for a good reason, like a nine-year-old asking for the keys to your car. You just know it's going to destroy him. You know what I mean? So um, sometimes I think, I was just thinking about why does God say no sometimes? Sometimes people will take credit if he starts blessing and starts giving us certain victories and sometimes we get, the head gets big. You know, Gideon, 
He had an army of 22,000 people in Judges 7, 22,000 men. And God says, cut it down to 300 because you guys will take the credit if, you do, if, if I let you have that big army. Cut it down to 300 men. And so God says, I, I had to put that on delay because I wanted to make sure your, you don't, the pride doesn't come in. And so I'm just going to close with this right here. Um, I just want to tell everybody, I notice, I think I just sense a lot of church people are hurt towards God um, because of the times in 2020 and suffering. And sometimes it could be a divorce or it could be, you know, people get bitter towards God. They take it out on God and you just can't win that way. But I've noticed through the years that um, when somebody's suffering or they go through something, they either get hot towards God and get on fire towards God, or they go completely the other way. Uh, there was a guy in the church, uh, I was just asking for his name and I could not, I haven't seen him probably in 30 years. And the person I was asking this to the other day on the phone, they knew his name right off the bat. And so this guy was missing church, his mom died. And so I drove out about 20 miles to his house, knocked on the door, haven't, haven't seen him for about a month in church. And while I was knocking, I could smell all this drugs. I could smell marijuana and stuff. And I thought, oh man, he's bitter towards God. He's taking it out on God. I could, that was it, never saw him again. But yet on another person in church that they went through some real bitter stuff. I want to tell you, they got in our church in 1962. They're st when their husband left them with nothing, and this guy was rich, left this lady poor. She is still in our church. She's getting ready to be 90 years old. She's on fire. So if you get better towards God, you're going to move. You're going to go down that one road. But it, that, that thorn in the flesh can also cause you to catch on fire for God. So I'm going to stop right there. Thank you.